good afternoon. One of the advantages of being last is that you get to think about all of the other presentations and say and grade that. <laughs> but uh, what we're what uh, what we're going to do today, and I'd like to uh, uh, to remind you, uh, I do have a table outside. I am not selling anything. If there's anything on that table that you'd like, leave me your name and your email address, and I will mail you the. Uh, uh, the uh, PDF copy of the uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, this is uh, like uh, like the uh, uh, the teacher said. This is the uh, 44th Infantry Regiment. One of the things that I was uh, uh, I, I noticed when I went when I went to do uh, all of these uh, regiments was that they did indeed have a lot of things in common. But uh, they all had a very unique history. We're going to meet some very interesting people uh, that served in the 44th, and we're going to see uh, what their role was here uh, in the uh, in the South, uh, particularly uh, as the uh, as the 44th went through uh, its uh, its career uh, from uh, 1813 to 1815. Let's see if I can figure this out. Yeah, Dean. The war was not going well in January 1813. Uh, we uh, we had uh, messed up. I guess that's the word I think. Messed up uh, a series of uh, of invasions of Canada. We had uh, uh, we had some uh, understandings, uh, some misunderstandings about what our goals were. And uh, by January 1813, uh, Congress was saying uh, too little, uh, too little men, too little spirit too little leadership, and they need a whole lot more. So they activated in January 1813 uh, about uh, 20 additional regiments of infantry uh, in the United States Army. Uh, what I've shown you on this slide is uh, what those uh, aggregates were. They were about a thousand man operation, but the most that any of these regiments ever had was six or 700. They never did get to their full strength. And we're going to see that that did influence how the 44th and the other regiments here in the South were used. Uh, we're going to try, we're doing this uh, primarily, uh, uh, I figured this out once. That turned it off. You know, I have to be retrained every time I come up with my answers. Okay. Thank you. What should an army consist of? Do we think our army then and now, and, this, and, and, and I, I did want to say something about then and now, when we start using terms like regiment, martial law, articles of, of war, tactics, we have to think like a 19th century soldier. If we try to ad adopt uh, a modern view of what martial law is, we will lose what martial law was. So what you'll see uh, in this is that we probably want an army. Who did that? <laughs> That's, uh, okay. We probably want an army that matches the population profile, right? We probably want an army that's homogeneous with the uh, with the uh, American population, and we probably want an army that exhibits patriotism. We didn't get that. We got a lot of men who were willing to serve. In fact, with only one percent of the population serving today in, in our armed forces, back in 1812 and 1815, one in 14 adult men in the United States served. Uh, in, in the army or the militia. That was a tremendous effort. That was larger than the numbers who served in World War II. So when we got ready to go to war, there was no real problem about where we were going to get the manpower. We had other issues uh, that we had to deal with. And we find, how come everybody just works except mine? Okay, what we find is our problem was recruiting. When do we begin to recruit? Back then, we used officers to recruit these regiments. 
So we needed the officers on board before we could begin recruiting. It was 18 months from the time this regiment was formed to the time it was prepared to take its first combat action. And that was, and that was endemic in the Army at the time. It took a long time. Uh, every one of the issues that you see that I'm going to discuss is an article of its own. We can discuss the Army regulations of the time. There was a battle in the United States regarding whether we were going to emulate the British, which was our heritage from, uh, from before the Revolution and our colonial times, or whether we were going to emulate the French. Now, if you remember, between 1783 and 1812, the French did did new plan for themselves on the continent of Europe. And there was large numbers of professional soldiers, uh, leaders in the army, who thought we should adopt a French model. That battle, that political argument, consisted right on through the declaration of war. And we'll see it wasn't until 1813 that the army finally decided which army manual, which regulation we were going to uh, train our forces in. Uh, we had the 7th Military District, which was uh, only came into effect in, uh, in uh, March of 1813. And uh, I, you'll hear me uh, use the word uh, William Gwain. Gwain was the publisher of the Philadelphia newspaper called the Aurora. But he was also uh, a huckster. And he wrote the Military Dictionary, which if you're going to do any research on the War of 1812, you should, you should uh, uh, at least have access to that dictionary. And he wrote the uh, Handbook for Infantry. What did he know about training troops in the field? Absolutely nothing. But he published a book, and it was adopted, and that was the book that we went to war with. Now, some of these reenactors that you'll see around here will say, oh my God, Dwayne's manual was a mess. And you know what? They're absolutely right. But that was the one that the leadership in Washington said we'll use. So we started training, recruiting, uh, under uh, some very unusual systems here. Anybody want to get paid? I got $5 a month. Now, $5 a month in 1812, believe it or not, was a competitive salary. <laughs> and look at your general officers. This is what the, these are the ranges in which they were paid. Uh, the officers got uh, allowances for quarters and forage. We still get that today, by the way. And the enlisted people got uh, bounties and land warrants. Much of the land in southern Illinois, a lot of the land in Missouri, a lot of the land in Iowa were given away to soldiers after the war because as there was some bonuses. Later in the, uh, early in the war, they were getting 120 acres. By the time the war ended, they were getting 480 acres in order to enlist, to encourage enlistments. But this was the pay structure uh, at the time. Camp life for a soldier is about what you can what you can imagine. They slept on straw. If they could, they slept in tents. Most people didn't have tents. And they went from fatigue duty to we, you know, we didn't have Jackson Barracks. We didn't have all these forts that we've got now. We had wilderness and we had a lot of it. So whenever a, we moved a, a, a force, like Jackson's force, from Fayetteville, Tennessee, down into, uh, uh, into Horseshoe Bend, they had to build the forts as they went. So they went from fatigue duty to sentinel duty to picket duty to fatigue duty to sentinel duty to picket duty. Did I say training? So you see some of the, you know, when, when, I, when I had a magistrate's court, I, uh, I usually required everybody to uh, turn their phones off. And except one day, uh, I, was in, I was in court and I did not turn mine off. <laughs> and it went off. And the guy that almost died laughing was the bailiff. <laughs> because I always had him escort from the court, anybody that didn't turn it on. Um, did I tell you that you had to be humble in order to be a, a presenter of these things? Okay. I 
found this list and I thought it was interesting. This is what the uniform cost in 1813. And this is, and that, if you want to know that, that comes up to about $34. Now, you can't, can't buy it, uh, and there's no National Guardsmen's left here, but you can't buy a jacket today for under $300. But this is the entire uniform. And, uh, and the current prices, and I think I had this in June of 1813, uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was what they wore. And uh, did they all get this every time? No. Did they all get replacements when they needed it? Not likely. Remember, we fielded regiments in Canada, not in blue, but in gray, because we didn't have enough blue cloth in the country. When the army went from 6,000 in 1812 to 64,000 authorized, uh, and then add the militia, I think the number that I constantly use is 286,000 people served during the war of 1812. Uniforms was an issue. Training was an issue. Housing was an issue. You get the picture? And there's more equipment that they carry. And I, I, uh, I go through the, uh, uh, the weapon. I have a different take. Where's, where's my weapons guy? This is my phone. OK. But I have a different take on the weapon. 144,000 of these weapons were, were manufactured at either Springfield, Massachusetts, or Harper's, uh, Harper's uh, Ferry in Virginia. Those were the two federal officers, uh, 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 arsenals. About that number, 150,000, were, were also manufactured by contractors. So we had a lot of weapons. We also had weapons, and it, and it talked about uh, uh, issuing Spanish rifles. You know what they were issuing up in uh, New York? German rifles, because we took them from the Hessians 30 years earlier and we kept them. Okay? So there was a, a Weapons was never really an issue, and we're going to see with the 44th there was a problem uh, with, uh, with this weapon, uh, and our last speaker uh, alluded to it uh, when I get there. Interesting guys here. By August, remember the regiment was formed in January. By August, we get our first appointments. Now, we know Colonel Ross was the commander of the regiment. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my friends said, now make sure you tell him you tell them that he was a drunk. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> uh, Henry Pierre was a, was a multilingual officer. He ended up at the end of the war as a, as a, as a, as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, he was assigned to the 44th, but guess where he was at the Battle of New Orleans? He was with the 7th. Because the, lead, the, the top guy in the 7th shot himself by accident. And they needed someone to command the seventh, so they moved uh, Pierre over and commanded the seventh. Isaac Baker ended up as a uh, uh, as a uh, ambassador. He was in the Louisiana legislature. He was a lawyer, and he uh, and he ended up his final days as a district judge in Louisiana. William O. Butler, you'll see him around. He is most famous for the storming of Monterey in 1847. He was a major general at the time. So he served, he started out in the 44th. Uh, he was also at Frenchtown, Raisin River Massacre. He was also there. So he was around for a long time. You might not know Nathaniel Pryor unless I tell you that he was Sergeant Nathaniel Pryor, Lewis and Clark Expedition to the Pacific. He came back and was commissioned in 1808. And by the, uh, by the War of 1812, he was a captain. He eventually lived out his days in Arkansas Territory. And he was in uh, the 44th. So I wanted to give you an idea who was in the unit. Uh, every, everybody was in the uh, 7th Military District. Those are the regiments that were attached to the 7th Military District. Uh, 2nd, 3rd, 7th, 4th, 39th, and 44th. That was all Flanoy had and then all Jackson had. That was it. There was about 300 uh, artillerymen. Uh, we are now up to September. Now, 
Sister Mary Joseph was absolutely correct 55 years ago. Sometimes I lack attention to detail. You will see Fort Stoddard born here twice. One of them should be Fort Storfer. Okay? But these were the forts in which uh, the 44th were known to have uh, worked, known to have been recruited, known to have, uh, have been at various times. And of course, the, two on the, the three on top of the list uh, are the barracks and the arsenal and uh, Fort St. Charles right here in, in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, a lot today you've heard about the Creek War. I'm going to go very quickly uh, through this, but uh, uh, through the winter of 1813-1814, uh, the focus is on uh, Jackson uh, and where things were going on uh, with Jackson in the Creek War. Uh, not a subject, the 44th did not participate in the Creek War. They still only had those five officers. Okay, so they still had a recruiting mission ahead of that as late as February of 1814. Uh, I do say something about the Articles of War. Uh, this was uh, one of my lecture topics at the, uh, at the War College. It was not anything like the Uniform Code of Military Justice is today. It came to us out of the British heritage uh, uh, the British Articles of War and the American Articles of War began to diverge from one another in 1776. Uh, the uh, Articles of War, which we went to, to war in 1812, was passed by Congress uh, in 1806. Uh, it was a very, very different system. Uh, I have an article on the desk outside about the Articles of War. Uh, these were some of the punishments, and of course uh, we had a hierarchy of punishments. Uh, whipping, the lash, cat and nine tails, prohibited during the War of 1812 in the Army. Congress passed the law in 1812 in order to encourage enlistments that they prohibited the use of whipping as a punishment uh, in, uh, in the War of 1812. But we did execute people. Uh, we executed about uh, 200. Uh, we actually court-martialed about 400, so uh, there were uh, extenuating circumstances in several of them. Uh, I had a, uh, I, I think yeah, I got to get into about a six-pack of Coors Light before I tell you about my argument with the district court judge up in Detroit. Uh, I, I gave a, uh, some lead-ins for the uh, amicus brief that went to the Supreme Court uh, regarding the use of Guantanamo. And whether or not we, in our past, had a history of trying civilians under the Articles of War. And uh, of course, I argued yes, we had. Uh, uh, Madison actually uh, exonerated uh, two, but we hung a bunch of them up there in, uh, on, on the Canadian border. We tried them by military court. You can call that a tribunal today and we hung them. Uh, a very famous hero that uh, liked hanging uh, or uh, shooting was a uh, uh, guy from uh, the Battle of Fort Erie, Perry. Perry captured American deserters on British ships during the Battle of Lake Erie. He did not afford them a military execution, he hung on. Very interesting discussion with that circuit court judge. We have not heard the last of Guantanamo, by the Okay, by uh, March of 1814, the officers are being assessed. More and more officers are coming in. A great many of them came from the Louisiana militia. A lot of them had French names. Oh, did I tell you there was a couple of Creoles here in town? Did I tell you that they were having problems with whether or not the Creoles would fight? Did I tell you that uh, over half of the population of, uh, of New Orleans was uh, free black or slave? Did I? No, I don't have to tell you that because everybody today told you that. Okay? So they were having a very difficult time. There is some confusion, some variant spellings. So a couple of the guys, uh, I can't say guys anymore. A couple of the writers from, uh, from the 19th century did get some French names mixed up, and uh, we're still trying to figure out who was in battery number one, 
uh, uh, closest to the levee. Um, I sort of know who was there, but some people disagree with me. And, uh, oh, did I tell you, Jackson and Claiborne had an interesting conversation back and forth, like, for five or six months. They were always uh, uh, talking uh, with each other. Uh, yes, the dark side of, uh, of New Orleans history is there. Um, I'm not sure that uh, it may be, I think it's Tulane University that has uh, the city records from, uh, from this period of time and actually have the uh, payment certificates where uh, uh, the city government and uh, the military would hire slaves at 25 cents a day uh, to uh, dig that trench that we dug out at the Rodriguez Canal. Uh, but there is a, a good side and a dark side uh, in every city, particularly in the South. But we're up to May, 1814. Okay. Uh, an interesting time in 1814, yes, uh, the British raided Washington and burned the capital. Yes, they invaded Maine. Many people down here in New Orleans don't know that the British didn't leave Maine until 1819. And so uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's on my bucket list of things to write about. Uh, the blockades were getting uh, tighter. Uh, move the available British forces out of uh, Europe now that we've succeeded in defeating uh, Napoleon. Napoleon has been defeated by this time, and uh, moved them to the United States to chastise the Americans. Uh, that one picture over there, that pile of rocks, what most people don't know, don't know, I took that picture myself, that is what remains of Fort Sullivan. Never heard of it? Fort Sullivan was in Maine. It was attacked by the British on July 1st, 1814, and taken that day. And we have uh, Canadian uh, and naval battles. Remember the summer of 1814 was Lundy's Lane, was the uh, taking of Fort uh, Erie, was the uh, uh, Battle of Chippewa. Uh, a couple of interesting guys came into the 44th, which you'll uh, note. One was Jackson's biographer, his name was John Reed. He was in the 44th. Uh, although Jackson did take him in as being an aide, he was assigned to the 44th. Richard Keith Call, where's my Florida natives? Richard Keith Call ended up as the territorial governor of Florida. He also was in the vein and attacked Spanish forces in Pensacola in a couple of months hence. So Richard Keith Call and John Reed were both in the 44th. The first combat action of the 44th was at Barataria. Uh, if you remember the story, uh, the British Royal Navy came in and offered uh, Lafitte some money and they offered him a commission and offered him uh, a lot of things that they were offering a lot of people along the Gulf Coast those, in those years. And, uh, and uh, Lafitte uh, writes to Claiborne and says, hey, I may be a privateer, but I'm still an American and uh, let's talk about this. Claiborne uh, calls his uh, brain trust together and say, what, we should, what should we do? Ross and Patterson said, I got a plan. And they take the 44th down to Barataria along with uh, some gunboats. And, uh, and uh, there's some indication that Ross and Peterson, now Peterson was the Navy commander here, and Ross was, of course, the brigade, the original commander of the 44th. There was some indication that Ross and Peterson had an agreement on the split of the prize money. I don't want to talk about privateers, it's another legal issue. Were the, uh, uh, were the Lafitte's uh, uh, privateers or were they pirates? And when were they pirates and when were they privateers and when were they American citizens? And uh, uh, I always ask people when they ask me legal questions, tell me who my client is and I'll give you the argument supporting their cause. <laughs> But uh, Ross and Peterson argued about the prize money until 1817. Congress had to make the decision of who got what out of that out of that raid on Barataria, and uh, and it was at it was at the raid on Barataria in September 1814 in which the 80 Barataria pirates ended up in. New Orleans jails. An interesting name mentioned 
earlier today was Livingston. Who do you think Lafitte's lawyer was? Never mind. Okay, at this point, there is an action going on here. The British are coming, the British are coming. And Jackson's views now are becoming a strategy because by October 1814, he had got his uh, Major General's Commission. He was in charge of the 7th uh, District. He was uh, cleaning up some things that he had to clean up about the, uh, about the, uh, the uh, Creek War. And he was forming in his mind, and you can see it in his letters back and forth, of what he's going to do uh, in New Orleans. Oh, by the way, the navalists out there will say that the Battle of New Orleans was won at Fayette. You know what happened at Fayette? A privateer by the name of Reed uh, on a privateer ship, nine guns, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the grand ship General Armstrong cut in to Fayette to get water and supplies in, Portuguese, in neutral Portuguese territory. By the time the sun went down, five British ships show up to get water and supplies at Fayette and decide that they are going to take the General Armstrong. That 90-man crew and its nine guns held off three British attacks, tore up those ships. It was a 10-day delay, and some arguments are being made that uh, Reed's defense of the General Armstrong at Fayel delayed the transports coming uh, from Europe 10 days, and that 10 days was the difference at Chimette. I'm not sure whether I believe that or not, but it's a good story. October, the British are coming. In the meantime, Jackson says, no one in Tennessee is safe until I get rid of all those Indians and all those British. And if the Spanish are supporting the British, all those Spanish. He is going to invade a country at which we are not at war, and he invades Pensacola. Read about it in my, uh, in my essay. The 44th was one of his attacking regiments. He collected all of the available and trained forces that he could get. He ended up with almost 5,000 troops to go up against the 277 guys that Spain had. Uh, he wasn't going to lose this one. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and we'll see that, uh, oh, on the way here from Florida, I had to uh, go uh, through Pensacola, so I, I, did, I diverted and I found Halifax Street. Halifax Street was the one that Richard Keith Call attacked down all the way to the to the uh, to the uh, bay, and uh, so I, I parked my uh, parked my car and walked the last four blocks down Halifax Street. Uh, Mid 20th century commercial architecture sort of loses something in translation, but uh, but the 44th roll was to attack down that axis of advance. They went right down to the beach. They took the Spanish guns at the end of the, uh, of the street, turned the, British, turned the guns on the British fleet, and if you listen to Governor Call, who would deny the Governor Call for long? I mean, after all, he's from Florida, he was a governor. He drove the British fleet off. Good work for the 44th. Anyhow, that was an interesting afternoon they had, and, uh, and, uh, and he did uh, take Pensacola. Either the British or the Spanish, and it's unclear who, blew up the forts. Writers, including Latour, maintain that he would have kept the 44th at Pensacola had the forts been defensible. But the forts were destroyed, Pensacola was not defensible, he could not afford the loss of manpower, could not afford the time and effort it took to rebuild the, 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 the fortifications. Turned the Choctaws loose on the, uh, on the uh, uh, retreating British, and the Choctaws chased them all the way to the Appalachian River. But uh, the 44th began its march and its sailing uh, back uh, to New Orleans because by November 6th to 8th, uh, 
keep in mind, British gun, British gun. Okay, Jackson gets to New Orleans. Yes, he's sick. Yes, he's got uh, some crazy things going on here. Yes, uh, uh, the legislature's uh, pulling Jackson's hair out. Uh, Claiborne's pulling his own hair out. Uh, they don't know exactly what to do, uh, but uh, uh, he decides to attack the British as soon as they come up off the uh, uh, off the waterway down on the on the uh, on the Delaware plantation. So the 44th was in line with the 7th, with the Marines, with all of the available uh, reserve detachments, and almost half the force was Coffee's uh, mounted uh, Tennessee uh, militiamen. But they attack. The 44th was specifically up against the levee uh, near the river. Uh, a lot of the action was, uh, was further inland uh, with the Tennessee. Uh, but on the 23rd of December, uh, the 44th is again in combat. Uh, gaining uh, experience, uh, at this point, Butler, whose name I gave you before, uh, it com is commanding the, uh, the maneuver elements of the 44th, and Pierre, whose name I gave you before, uh, is commanding the 7th. So, uh, now keep in mind the 7th was not an, uh, a, a, a weak unit. The 7th had people that created Paris du Chien in Wisconsin. The seventh had people in uh, in uh, uh, Indiana Territory. The seventh really operated all the way up and down the Mississippi River uh, for a greater part of the war. And the seventh was one of the original regiments that was in the uh, that was in the service from 1808. So uh, so let's not forget that the seventh was a was a fighting force too. But uh, at New Orleans, uh, the seventh was commanded by officers from the 44th. Uh, oh, did I tell you there was a treaty? We signed the treaty. Right? Uh, not we didn't sign the treaty. The treaty was signed, okay, and it was in route. And I can give you the long, sad tale about how long it took and where the hurricanes were and, and, how, the, and how instead of going into Chesapeake Bay and up to Washington, I had to go into New York and that delayed it for three more days. And that, we're sent Simons, Georgia. That was Cockburn's invasion of, uh, of Cumberland. In St. John, uh, because of the delay in getting the cartel ship from Liverpool to uh, to Washington, 44th had nothing to do with that. Okay, the big one. I'm going to get an argument here. There were ten battles of in the New Orleans campaign. One of which, well, two of which. We're at New Orleans. But if you look at the British campaign plan, Cockburn's action in Georgia, Lambert's action at Tower, Packingham's action here, the Battle of the Lakes, Pensacola, I can give you all ten, but there were ten battles in New Orleans. Uh, if you really think about it. Now, where was the regiment at the Battle of New Orleans? A guy that did the, uh, the weapons thing is gone, but guess what? The fourth, the 44th was the luckiest, as a soldier, the 44th was the luckiest regiment at New Orleans because they never fired a shot. They were out of range. They were they were uh, man. They had they were armed with muskets, and the British attacked to the right of them, to the left of them, and to the palm, to the right of them, to the left of them. But they attacked too far out of range, and three 19th-century writers, including Latour, said that the 44th never fired a shot. The seventh did. The 44th had guys in battery number one. There were individual uh, uh, heroism uh, displayed, and several people got brevetted uh, uh, additional rank uh, because of their role at, uh, at New Orleans. 
And of course, did someone mention that they declared martial law? It was back in December they declared martial law. But again, keep in mind historically that Jackson's authority and what he did was under a rule that went into effect in 1806. There was, did they actually declared martial law here after Katrina, didn't they? Did they? I don't think so. I, I, uh, uh, and the reason that they didn't do it is because you guys don't like martial law. You guys, now, uh, out on the table out there, there's one about the uh, martial law that was declared in Detroit. It would be interesting to 1814 it was not what you think. But uh, they did declare martial law. Uh, and he was fine. He went through the thing. And what was the 44th doing? The 44th was part of the gang that went around and arrested people. They were... You know, there was no provost marshals back then. You, you went down to the barracks and you said, okay, who's up for duty today? McGinty's company. Well, get him out here. We're going to go pick up a judge and export, e escort him to the city limits. So you found that Jackson was using not the militia to enforce martial law. He was using the regulars from the 7th and the 44th to enforce martial law. There were passports issued. There had, you had to come through checkpoints to get into the city. You had to go through a checkpoint to get out of the city. Those checkpoints were manned by the regulars, not by the militia. Because those were the people who federal Major General Andrew Jackson commanded. He had more control over the regulars than he had over the Tennessee militia at that point because he was not in the chain of command. Okay, by uh, February and March, we see the 44th, uh, uh, they're going to disappear. Uh, many of the regiments disappear. 82% of all of the serving officers in War of 1812 were discharged. 82%. This was a draconian, in our day, remember the reduction in force, the rift? We had rifts after Korea, rifts after Vietnam, rifts after the First Gulf War. This was a reduction in force. They went from, from 48 regiments down to seven. So we see that it was 64,000 down to 10. Now, before that occurred, and of course the ratification, you know, we're going back and forth with the ratification here. The, the ending date of the war, depending on who you read and who you believe, was either the 15th of February or the 17th of February. Now remember, the 15th was the day that Congress said, oh yeah, let's do it. The 17th was the day that Madison actually put his ink to paper and signed the proclamation. When did the war end? Don't say it's unimportant because on one of the things I'm doing for next year is uh, when did the war end and when was, what was the last battle? The USS Peacock took HMS Nautilus on 30 June 1815 in the Sundra Strait, which is, in case you need to know where that is, it's where Krakakoa was. And, uh, and the Nautilus took, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Peacock took the Nautilus uh, on, on June 30th. So uh, uh, the 44th now uh, uh, disappeared on the 17th of May. Uh, five officers of all the officers were retained. Uh, Patterson and Ross were still uh, uh, urinating in each other's boot. <laughs> Can you say that in the world? Aren't you glad they didn't put me on first? <laughs> okay. Now, what about the 44th? Yes, if you're going to go to war, don't do what Rumsfeld did. Don't 
don't say you're going to go to war with the army you got. You've got to have an army 